Nå, jeg kan ikke mig. There we go. You got me? Yep, we've got yeah. No video though. <laughs> no video now. Oh. Yeah. There we now go. There we go. Sorry, I had to do it on my phone because on my um I couldn't add it from my um phone to my laptop off the link. Yeah, no, that's a good. Way. Uh thank you very much for giving me your time, mate. I really appreciate you um having a chat with me today. No, no problem at all. Um yeah, so I'll just give you a bit of a rundown, mate, of what I do with my um, Facebook page and um, Instagram page. Um, so I try to promote the game here in Perth. Um, I go to you know, local games, junior games, um, seniors, uh, you know, take photos, videos, and try to promote the game here in Perth. Um, I share all the news with all the clubs and stuff, and then also um, all the NRL stuff as well. Um, share that around on the page so people are up to date with what's going on. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so just getting to uh, your career, mate. Um, yeah, you refereed over 354 games in first at top level. Um, your debut was Brisbane versus, versus South at Suncourt, mate. How was that um, for you, mate, coming out, at, you know, being your first game uh, as head referee? Yeah, it was awesome. And, and like you say, at Suncorp Stadium, which is, you know, it's probably one of the, the best rugby league grounds in the world. Um, and I hate saying that as you know, born and bred New South Welshman, but um, it is a great um, venue, not only to be on the field, but also to watch footy from as well. And, and funnily enough, I'm a, I'm a local South Sydney um, junior, so I played junior league in South Sydney and played a bit of um, rep footy for South, and it was South and Bronco. So um, to be able to make my debut with the club that I sort of um, grew up around, I knew a lot of people there, and actually there was a few players in the South side that I was mates with, so... Um, it was a pretty pretty special day, daunting, um, but uh, yeah, pretty special. How did you um, find that? You know, having the mates and stuff in the in the South team. How did you find that sort of refereeing against them? Oh, that was fine because I'd grown up when I first started refereeing um, in local footy. So at, at park football, um, virtually every game I refereed, I refereed mates so either I played with or against or you know what I mean, or went to school with or, or stuff because um, sort of around that area, around Redfin, everyone sort of knew everyone. So um, I've been doing that my whole sort of career. I, I remember sitting in judiciary hearings where one of my best mates I'd sent off on the weekend, you know, for fighting and um, and stuff like that. So that that was never an issue to me. When, you know, when I ran out in the field, it's just two two footy teams. And and for me, I just want to get everything right and I don't want to make an idiot of myself and look stupid. So I don't care who's playing, you know, I just want to be right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, yeah, speaking of be, you know, park footy and stuff like that, mate, how did you um, go from being a player um, into going into refereeing? Yeah, so I started playing footy when I was three years old, so I've you know, been around it my whole life. And I was fortunate enough that just because of the era I lived in and the, and the age group I was in, um, I played with some really good footballers. So from three till 16, I played with Zetlin in the local South Juniors. And in that footy side over the years, you know, there was – you know, a number of players that went on to play first grade and, you know, a couple that went on to play for Australia as well. So um, we had a really good footy side and we won seven comps in a row undefeated. So we didn't lose a game for seven years. So um, so I got into rep sides virtually off the back of that, I think, because we were a successful footy side and there was good players around me. They made me look good. So, um, yeah, I played at Zetland for a long time and then a few of us swapped to another club, you know, to sort of make it a little bit competitive and we went to Alexandria Rovers and then we played Zetland in the grand final for a couple of years and so it was a re really good. Um, then a lot of the guys that I played with got graded so they were playing um, reserve grade and stuff and, and back then it was under 23s for South and I sort of left back on my own and um, I got found out real quick that I was a terrible footballer. Um, I just happened to be in a good football side with some good players that made me look good. Um, so yeah, I sort of wasn't sure what to do. I was 18 at the time. And um, I bumped into my old footy coach, who was a coach at Zetland when I started. And uh, he, he was an older fellow and he'd started refereeing um, just to keep fit and stay involved in the game. And he sort of 
said to me, oh, you probably should come and try this then if you're not sure what you want to do. And I was a bit of a loose kid and I was sort of running the streets around Redfern and stuff at the time. And I won't say on air what I actually said to him because I hated referees when I played. I was a little <laughs> cheeky smart ass. I still am a smart ass, but um, yeah, so it took him a little bit to convince me. But um, the minute I ran on the field and I remember the game, I, was, I, I vividly remember my first game was a little under sixes game and I fell in love with it. I just really enjoyed it. And without trying to sound too sort of conceited or whatever, um, I felt it was something I'd be pretty good at. I felt, you know, cool. straight away, I just thought I'm connected to this. And, um, yeah, it's probably, you know, I, I'm not a religious person at all. I'm, I'm the, probably the furthest person, but I believe in karma, you know. And I think bumping into an old coach that day um, has had a major impact on my life. So, yeah. Yeah, nice. I mean, um, you know, going from playing the game to referee, you know, you know what a player is thinking it to a certain point as well. Um, you know, and yeah, it helps you make those judgment calls that you need to. Yeah, I think um, my longevity and the reason why I, I had such a long time in the game and the relationships I've built up and, and the opportunities I've been given post my football career is based on that. It's based on having a really good player rapport and understanding. I think that was my skill and my strength as a referee. Um, I think the fact that I could understand where how players were thinking and it's funny, I was, had a conversation with Robbie Farrell the other day, doing a little bit of work with um, and he was talking to me about him as when he, when I refereed him, and and I always knew what Robbie, and was, he's not the only. There was plenty of other players I could just tell by you know I could have a look at him, and I knew it was a day to have a joke with him, or it was a day to be really you know jump on him and be real you know terse and, and stern with him. So, um, and that's a skill set that I think I got from playing and being around footballers my whole life. Yeah, nice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when you were a kid, mate, um, who was your idol, um, or who did you idolise? You know. And, and what was it about them that um, you idolised? Yeah, it, in rugby league, it was um, it's funny. I was a Balmain supporter as a kid, so Balmain Tigers. Um, okay. I had a, a you know a, a real connection with South Sydney as well. But um, I, I, you know, I was a Balmain fan, and I remember you know spending a lot of time at Leichhardt Oval as a kid, running around on the hill and stuff. But um, what really stands out for me back in those days was um, watching Larry Coral play. So he's an Indigenous winger for for the Tigers and. It was just, it was like he had spiders on him all the time. When he got the ball, the whole, it was, it, it reminded me of some of the great players now, you know, when, and for a winger back then, it was a completely different game. Wingers didn't have the same impact they, they have on a game of rugby league now. But every time he got the ball, the whole crowd got up expecting something to happen. Like he was always going to beat that first, there was always going to be a break when Larry got the ball. Um, so he was probably the first footballer that I really sort of, um, looked up to and, and, and wanted to sort of be like. But I played in the halves and at fullback a little bit. So, like, the, the player that, you know, when you're a kid and you say, I'm this player, I was, I was always Peter Sterling. I wanted to be Peter Sterling. Um, just the way he played rugby league and how tough he was back in that when I was a kid. Um, you know, he, he, he was who is who I wanted to be. And, and I hated Parramatta as well back then as a kid. Uh, yeah, not, not many people did like him, mate. So unless you're an absolute Parramatta fan, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, you mentioned there that... Um, yeah, your favourite player was an Indigenous man. Yourself, Indigenous as well. Um, whereabouts is your family from, um, you know, your roots from? Yeah, so there's a long story there, a long history in that. Um, well, not history, I, I don't know my history. Um, so I, uh, up until, which is funny that Larry Coral was my best player, my favourite player, but up until I was about 14, 15, I, I've never met my father. So I still to this day, I've never met my father. So I didn't know anything about, and my mum never spoke. I never asked and I still haven't. I haven't done a lot of research around it. But um, so um, so I didn't know anything about my background on my father's side. It wasn't, uh, it was around 14, 15. And one of my friends who's, you know, grew up like, like a virtually like family, um, his mum obviously knew a little bit about my background and said, well, your grandmother lives down the road um, on your father's side, just down at Erskineville. Um, so... I had, out of nowhere, we, me and one of my mates one day, 14 or 15 year old, no, you know, went and knocked on this door of this lady that I never met. I couldn't imagine what she would have thought when she opened the door and said, These two young fellas knocking on the door, she would have been grabbing for a handbag or something, we're going to rob her. Um, but she opened the door and I sort of gave her, you know, sort of said, Oh, I'm Gavin, I think you're my grandma and stuff. And then so she, I, I had a conversation with her and she gave me a bit of background that, you know, they were from up uh, north coast of New South Wales, so, you know, Dungutty area. So I've, you know, had a little bit of research into my 
you know, my roots there. And there are you know, a little bit of finding some stuff and through speaking to people and mentioning names and they'll be like, oh, yeah, we know of that family and stuff like that. So um, still, you know, don't have a lot of information. And, you know, when you start to trace into um, Indigenous families, especially through the 60s and, and 50s, um, you know, there's a lot of stolen generation and stuff like that. So not a lot of people have a lot of um, knowledge of, you know, their roots. So there's a little bit of that in there as well. So um, hopefully going down the track, I learn a little bit more, but I've always had that connection. So I went, you know, grew up in, in you know, a fairly, you know, indigenous area in Redfern in, in Sydney. Um, went to school with, you know, played footy with a lot of indigenous boys. Um, and I've always had that connection. So it made a lot of sense to me that, you know, all my best friends all, you know, growing up and everyone I hung out with and connected with were, you know, indigenous. So, um, yeah, it just made sense to me when it, when I found out it, it really it just clicked and um, yeah it was it was a real turning point for me because you know ha having some history and knowing a little bit of, about that side of my family sort of sort of helped. Yeah, awesome. I mean, you know, I I, I personally couldn't imagine how that would feel. You know, not knowing uh, where you come from and then to find out. You know, um, it's pretty cool. Um, do you do you take your like your kids and your uh, wife on that sort of journey with you um they, yeah. are they really involved with it yeah so i'm really lucky not lucky I, I i think it's just that i've my wife is um she's amazing when it comes to that stuff she really um is, is starting to you know be a really big ally in indigenous affairs and indigenous issues um and i, I always talk about it's anything and whether it be indigenous whether it be um homophobic whether it be um you know the patriarchy and you know and, and women's rights and stuff the people that are involved in it, if they speak up, it just sounds like whinging. But when you get allies that come out and really speak for, um, strong, um, yeah, it makes a big difference, right? You're hearing other voices, not just the same voices jumping up and down. So she's really big on that. And she's really big on um, making sure that, you know, any opportunity that comes our way, we, we jump on it when it comes to anything to do with the Indigenous side of the family. And same for my kids. So I've got a grandson as well. And, um, you know, we, we really push the fact and he, he at school now he's in some Indigenous programs and stuff like that where, you know, I want them to learn as much as they can because I missed out on that. You know, so I want them to have an understanding of, you know, it's it's the world's, you know, oldest living culture. It should be celebrated in this country, black, white, you know, everyone should should celebrate, you know, what is an amazing culture when you dig into it and, you know, such a resourceful culture, a survive, you know, a, a, you know survivors. People have been tried to be, you know, taken away from this earth and taken off the earth you know they've really tried over a long period of time to to get rid of us but um we're survivors and we keep going so i'm really you know that that gives me strength and i know my kids really enjoy learning about that as well yeah awesome mate yeah i bet i bet i bet the kids and your, and your grandson um do great i mean that's yeah that's awesome um i was reading up online mate um you came out um, to nrl.com uh, about, about a story. Um, I mean, I don't want to go into the details about it, but um, um, I mean, if you want to talk about it, I know no, you... No, I'm happy you... to talk about it, mate. That's that's why I came out, to give it a voice, you know what I mean? Like, I'll jump up on top yeah. of, the, of the soapbox every time when it comes to looking after our kids, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something that people don't want to believe happens in society anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. People, you never hear people talk about it. You never hear people talk about child sexual abuse. It's it's you know there's a stigma even bringing it up people don't want to yeah. believe that there's people that they know that are capable of that because it is and one of the things and yeah you know, i really appreciate um so zach bailey who from the nrl.com who did that story and um there's not too many people that i would have done that story with and zach was one of them because i knew and i, I had a, a really good relationship with zach from some other stuff that i knew that it'd be told well and it would be um you know, it would give me a voice to be able to jump up and down and, and scream from the rooftops that we need to, this is something that we need to do. And there's a couple of things that I really, you know, when, when I talk about it, that I really want to get across is that, yeah, the majority of the cases of child sexual abuse is someone you know or someone that's family. It's not some, you know, person sneaking behind bushes. It's someone that you know. And that's the biggest thing. And the other part of it is that I really encourage people not to force kids into, um, yeah, uh, into situations they shouldn't be in. And, and the easiest one is, you know, you turn up to a family function or whatever and the aunties or the cousins are there and you force your kids to go up and give them a hug and a kiss. Because now you're forcing kids into erotic situations. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it, it, you're forcing them to do something that they're not comfortable with. With me, with my, my kids, 
Um, if they want to run up and give their auntie and uncle a kiss, I'll, no problem because that's they're, they're making that choice. But as soon as they say, oh, no, no, we, ne we never force them because that's that gives people an in, right? It makes yeah. that kid think that they have to have that relationship with someone even if they don't feel comfortable with it. So it's all about letting the kids be comfortable with who they want to run up and kiss. I know with, with my family and that some days, especially with Cooper, with my grandson, some days he'll run up to family and, and, and want to be all over him. Then other days he just doesn't want to go near him. You know, some days he'll run up and give you a kiss and other days he, he doesn't want anything to do with you. Um, and we never force him to do it because we never want him to think that, you know, he has to do something he doesn't want to do. Um, so the big thing is about education. And we talk to him about it as well. We talk to him about these, you know, he's nine at the moment. Um, but the, really, as soon as they can communicate, you should start to teach them about, you know, what, what is right, what is wrong. Not, you know, and it's how you, how you, you do that. Um, is to give them an opportunity to say no to people and say, so even we start conversations. So when he comes home from school or whatever, we talk about, okay, who did you, you know, what did you do today? Who was there? Um, if it's someone we'd never heard of before, okay, what were they there for? What did they do? Okay, how did you feel around them? Oh, yeah. You just start to, and then you just, you know, get some talking about it as well. Um, same at, you know, sporting events or whatever. They go footy training. Okay, who was there today? Oh, okay. oh who was that other person you mentioned? Oh, that was someone's father that was helping. Okay, how did you feel around that person? So it's just, you know, creating conversations. Um, because like I said, there's a massive stigma around it. We, um, you know, and it's still happening. It's you know, the statistic, the statistics around it are one in four males in this country, uh, you know, have sub have been subject to some form of um, sexual abuse as a child. And that's you know, you sit in a room and you look around, and you think, wow. Um, so yeah, yeah. You know, um, it took me a long time to be able to speak about it because you know yeah. I felt plenty of different kind of ways around it over a long period of time. Um, but now I'm more than comfortable because of, you know if it, if it means that one one person either feels the courage to then come and, and speak out about being a survivor and, and feel a lot better for it because I would you know there was a lot of depression a lot of drugs and stuff when I was a kid coming through um, to deal with that stuff um, so if it gives someone else a voice or if it gives some parent the, that moment where they go you know what yeah I, you need to be a little bit better around this because we just don't think about it we, you know we don't we We'd like to think it never happens, but it does. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you you just mentioning then, um, you know, you talking about how the your children feel around um, someone that you know is new new in the situation. Um, I never thought about it myself. I mean, I'm I'm a father. I've got uh, twelve kids between me and my partner. We've got twelve kids, oh. and I never never thought of that sort of stuff as well. Like um, you don't realize, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and we're we're going through a, uh, a shitty situation at the moment where um, we believe my my older son to my ex partner has gone through something like that um, because he has demonstrated sexualized behaviours to um, his brothers um, and he and mine and my my new partner's um, daughter and we we feel that something's happened to him but we can't prove it he won't say yeah. anything and it's hard. Okay. Yeah. It's about trying to create safe spaces for people to talk, you know, and, and the language that you use when you talk and how you, how you do it and making people, you know, comfortable. And, you know, I, I was always worried. For me, it was, it was different. So growing up, you know, when, when it was with me, it was early 80s um, and there was a massive stigma around homosexuality back then. So not being educated on what happened. Now it was man on, on, on man on, on me then I'm starting to think around the homosexual. I was scared to say anything because I'm am I homosexual now or so. Then I had this real, you know, I, I, almost a hatred of, of homosexual uh, homosexual people for a while. You know, what I mean, I was homophobic for throughout my early teens because I thought that was a homosexual thing because I wasn't educated on it. You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, and you, you see, uh, for me, it was, there was a lot of um, behaviour swings as well, mood swings. So, as a kid, if you look at my school reports, you can actually pick the date around yeah. where it happened to me yeah, okay. because the comments wow. on school reports and stuff just changed my my work was still fine I, I, I was a pretty you know like smarty sort of kid like I wasn't too bad but I was generally if you read all my reports I was you know loving fun to be around you know the, the joker and then all of a sudden they just were they started getting darker and darker and darker where there were some classes where I was out of the class before I even walked in it because of my attitude towards, especially male teachers and stuff like that and i was just a, you know a, 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 so you can we go back on it now I look back on my report cards and you can just see it so yeah. 
they're the things that you've got to look out for as well. And it's about conversations and having that ability. And, you know, I know it's easy to say now because I'm an adult and stuff and I think back to when I was a kid, if I want to talk to people, I don't know. No one ever, that was never a thing. No one even had any inkling that it happened to me. But if someone did, I, I don't know if I would have spoken or not, you know what I mean? But I was never given that opportunity, so. Yeah. Um, have you got any um, uh, places or um, stuff that you've put you've put in place, uh, whether it be a foundation or something, that people can go to, to um, like myself, you know, that uh, need that help with uh, my, my kids or um, other people that are going through the similar thing? Yeah, so I don't have anything at the moment, but I have started. So I did in last year, COVID sort of got rid of it. So I had done a bit of a, a paddle out for child abuse where I just raise awareness and stuff like that. Um, hopefully I'll get back into getting that back up and running. But my for me, I was just jumped onto a couple of organisations. So Child Safe is one where they go into um, organisations and child safe their organisations so and teach people around seeing signs and go into sporting organisations and teach coaches, you know, to see and see and understand what you know where behavioral patterns change and stuff like that and and for them for the coaches to be safe and always make sure they're safe um just jumped on board with another foundation called blue knot um so they're they're more around child tra around tra trauma and stuff like that which encompasses all, all different kinds yeah. um so there's there's plenty of organizations out there that um are there to assist it's just around you know especially in this day and age is is, is googling around and and find them and, and and finding what's best for you so there's no it's it's like it's like most things in life there's no one thing that's going to be the best for each individual person um it's about finding what way is best for you because you're dealing with when you're dealing with your own kids or your own families or, or people they're all going to be different you're going to have to use different styles to get through to different people so it's doing a bit of research um and the scary the scary thing is when you start doing research is how prevalent it, this stuff is so it actually makes you really panic and really overprotective of your own kids. Yeah. Which is absolutely. a good thing. Which is a good thing. Yeah. I'd rather be overprotective and, and, and it not happen than sort of be a little bit loose and all of a sudden, you know, you've got a child who's really got to work really hard throughout their whole life to sort of get over it. Yeah, absolutely. Or not, I mean, even, that, yeah. Actually, not even get over it, to deal with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got to look into that sort of stuff. With, like I said, my son. Um, yeah, like I said, we. It's we good to see some signs, though, right? Like that's the thing. Yeah. Like you know, you've noticed, and, and and now there's an opportunity for. So I look back on mine. I wish someone had seen some signs. Like I said, I don't know how I would have reacted, but no one ever. And I and I look like I said, I look at my reports, and there was obviously a behavioural change, but no one in my family or that picked it up. So I would love for someone to do that, and maybe, you know, instead of waiting thirty years, thirty five years to to tell my story I could have done a long time ago and, and had my childhood back and, you know, lived and been much better than what I am now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the camera's gone there, mate. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Um, fine. Um, speaking of that dark time in your life, mate, um, you know, how did you, how did you get out of it with mental health being a big thing these days? How did you get out of that sort of depressive time? Um, uh, yeah, for, for me, sport was sort of the biggest thing. Um, I always, through, through it all, even when I was like at, at my worst and even when I was, um, you know, dabbling in drugs and stuff like that, I always had footy there. So when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16, I was still playing. And then um, 18 onwards, I had the refereeing side of it. So being involved in a sport, um, and having some kind of structure actually um, helped me because um, I never I, I, I never had structure as a kid. Like I, I had to do what I wanted when I wanted and stuff like that. But then being involved in sports, you have to you have to turn up training, you know, turn up to the game on time. If you didn't do that, you didn't make it. And then refere refereeing saved my life. When I started refereeing, it became even more structured. You know, I mean, there was training. There was you know, there was a lot of dependence. If I didn't turn up on a Sunday morning the kids didn't get to play footy. So then there was dependence on me as well. And then when I was on the field, I actually had, you know, people looking up to me like these kids and stuff like that. So it gave me, it gave me a, a real sort of confidence boost and stuff like that. So um, they were, they were the main things. And as, as I got on, um, you know, a lot of physical exercise, like going to the gym and stuff like that um, as a, you know, in, in my thirties and forties really helped with my, my mental side of it. Um, I still have, times when you know and, and days and, and some nights where 
you know, it gets really tough. Um, and it could be, there's plenty of triggers for me as well. It could be watching a TV show and something happens or a comment or, you know, and, I've, and my wife sort of knows and I'll just get up and, you know, they'll be in the middle of watching a, a movie and there'll be something in it and it'll just trigger something. <clears throat> there's smells. Sometimes the smell can trigger stuff. So it's about then having, you know, the tools to be able to deal with that and it's how I deal with that post. That. And yep. a lot of it for me at the moment is the physical side of stuff. So, you know, when I'm feeling a bit down, I try and find time to get to the gym or go for a run or grab the gloves and hit the pot, you know, punch the, the boxing bag for an hour or so, which um generally helps. But that, that's going to be different for everyone. Some people might be reading books. Some people that might be, you know, listening to music, which is another one of mine. I'll throw the headphones on and, and listen to some music. So, um, yeah, it's just about finding out what, what is best for you. But having something, it might be a conversation with someone, you know what I mean? I've got a lot of good friends that I can talk to, which which helps. I'm, yeah, reasonably lucky um, when it comes to that side of stuff because I've got plenty of options. Yeah, cool. No, that's, that's good, mate. It's, uh, it's a good good advice there too, mate, you know. Um, speaking of your wife, mate, Casey, um, making her refereeing debut, mate, um, how was that for you? Um, you personally and you as a family, how was that? Yeah, so we got to do something that's really unique that you know, a lot of people don't get to do. So we got to be professional athletes you know, in an elite sport together. You know, I mean, not too many people can say that they do that with their wife. And and I know a lot of people saying it gets cliche, but Case, my best friend, you know, I mean, so to be able to do it with her and um, yeah, we 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 only got a couple of years together, but it was it was awesome. But um, she's you know, for Case, she she's dealing like she has to compete with men every day. You know, I mean, the game doesn't slow down because she's a female. So she's a female in a male dominated sport where she has to be as good as the men and, and as fit and yeah. You know, so. You know, I'm in awe of how hard she has to train and what she does to, to be able to stay at that level. So, yeah, I, you know, for, for a you know, big part of the back end of my career, my inspiration was her. And it was, you know, trying to stay on top of my game so that I could be around and, and, and spend more time with her in, in, in there and be around for those moments. So, um, yeah, she's um, – and she's a much better um, referee than I ever was. Um, <laughs> oh, but like, I mean, in, in, at the levels where she's at, she's way advanced yeah. than I am um because she and she works harder than i ever did and um she deserves yeah a lot more than what she gets yeah awesome i mean i was reading up that you used to um referee your first international game together as well um yeah, yeah well, that would have been a really proud moment as well for you yeah, and of all places in bangkok thailand <laughs> so, um, yeah we refereed a game we went to thailand for a week a friend of mine was coaching the um thailand side um, and they were playing against the Philippines. And so he contacted me and said, no, yeah, any chance you can come across and, and do this game? So we decided that all right, we'll take a holiday. So we booked a holiday to Thailand to go and assist and help help them out and went across there and did the game. I was actually injured at the time. I shouldn't have even been running. My calf was shot and um, I got through it. And yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's cool. Um, what are, you, what are you up to these days with your role? I know you last season you had a role at the West Tigers. Um, what was your main role with them? Yeah, so my actually my main role at the moment, so I'm, I work full-time at New South Wales Rugby League. Um, so I'm uh, working um, referee development and education. So I run referees courses and stuff. And I coach <coughs> a squad of young referees that referee all the you know, uh, junior rep games. And I also do a little bit of work in um, Indigenous programs. So working with um, some Indigenous programs over here. So that's my full-time role. Um, that's yep. what pays the mortgage. Um, but I've been lucky enough uh, to, yeah, do a bit of consultancy with the West Tigers. So I'm there just a couple of mornings a week of training. And then on game day, I sit in the box with Madge and I just listen in to what the referees are saying and how they're saying it and, um which then gives us an indication of, of where our players are at and who they're talking to the most and then getting information out to them about, you know, getting on side. I do a bit of work through the week with the players around that too. You know, we, we want to be as compliant as we can and um, not give away, you know, not give away, you know, too many penalties in six, six scans because, you know, the, the speed of the game now, it's um, too quick and it's too hard to pull it back if you lose momentum. So, yeah, um, yeah there's a little bit of that. So that's been really enjoyable. I've learned a lot. Um, been around Madge, like Madge is, yeah, you know, such a good coach. So for me, for my career going forward as a coach, you know, I'm learning a lot from him and, yeah, you know, 
just seeing the way he interacts with people and stuff like that. So it's been a great experience seeing it from the other side as well, you know, like just seeing how how they look at things differently than how we look at as referees. So I think the insights I get there helps me to give some coaching to, to younger referees as well. So, yeah, I'm yeah, pretty awesome. fortunate. Pretty fortunate. That's awesome. That's awesome. Also, mate, yeah. Actually, last year I was also lucky enough to be around the Origin side as well. So I did a little bit of the same stuff with the New South Wales Origin team and with the Indigenous All Stars. So I got to hang out with guys for a week. So a couple of the boys at the All Stars team were giving it to me saying I was just there to collect tracksuits because I didn't do anything. <laughs> I'll take them. Yeah, that's it, mate. Absolutely. Um, what have you got? What advice have you got for kids um, wanting to get? Um, into the refereeing in the NRL. So, I mean, I, I know over here we've got a, a fair few junior referees. What advice have you got for them to get into uh, the NRL system? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of hard work, right? Like, you think about refereeing, to be a full... The thing is, it's a full-time professional career now. So you get to, to be a full-time athlete. So I was a full-time athlete until I was 49 years old. Like, not too many people can say that. So, you know, once you get there, you can have a really long career. Um, it's a lot of hard work, though, because refereeing, there's only 20, 20 full-time referees. So it's a very sort of pointy end to get to. Um, but like I said, the rewards are great. You know I mean? Like, as a, as a rugby league fan, not only do I get paid to, to be running around on, you know, in, in the best rugby league competition in the world, but also I get to hang out with, with my mates all week. It's like, I, I say it's like being at school, you know, and I get to hang out with my mates all week and then footy on the weekend. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great job. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of hard work, a lot of ups and downs to get there, you know what I mean, in refereeing. Um, the biggest piece of advice is just just listen. Refereeing, I, I, like 350 odd games I did, and I was still learning. You know what I mean? You know, you speak to anyone, you're still, because things happen on the footy field that you've never seen before. The, the game is, you know, it is what it is. So you're always learning. So if you're always listening, um, you know, you, you, you're going to learn. And, and like, you, you might have a conversation, some a coach might have a conversation with you for, 40 minutes it might only be one thing that they say that makes you a better better referee so you know if you switch off or just you know think oh this person doesn't know what they're talking about you may miss the most important part of that conversation so yeah listening's the, the best way to get better yeah awesome the perfect advice for you um what advice have you got for kids in life in general mate um yeah whether it be refereeing or sports or school or just anything like um, yeah, what advice have you got for these kids coming up today? Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, Casey and I have a saying, and it's quite simple. It's don't be a dick. Right? Like, I, 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 I'm a big believer. So for me, I want every, every interaction I have with someone to be positive for either me or them. Right? If I'm a dick around it, well, you know, it's not going to, someone's going to miss either. I'm not going to get what, what I need to get out of it or they're not. So it's just, it's just, you know, just, just don't be a dick. Just be a good person. You know I mean? That, that's my advice. Be a good person. And I think the generation of kids coming through at the moment are pretty good, especially when it comes to social issues and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I think we're, you know, we're, we're moving forward as a country. But, yeah, I think the best piece of advice is just don't be a dick. Just, just accept everyone. Um, take in everything. Enjoy experiences. Ride out the goods with the bads. Don't don't get too caught up in social media. It's, it, I love social media, um, yeah. but, you know, don't take it too seriously. Don't let it affect your mindset. Don't let other people, um, you know, or what they're doing on social media affect how you feel about yourself because, you know, man, it's, it, everyone has the good and the bad. Everyone yeah. has them. No one, no one in this world has the perfect life. Everyone yeah. has tough days and everyone has great days. So it's just riding them out. You know what I mean? You just wait. If you're having a couple of bad ones in a row, the good one's coming somewhere. You just keep working for that good one. Uh, perfect, mate. Perfect advice. Um, you know, with this uh, expansion that's happened, you know, uh, with the Dolphins coming in, obviously the NRL won't look at um, having the 17th team for too long. What do you think Perth chances are of uh, being the 18th team? I've said it for a long time. It is probably one of the, the biggest downfalls of our game at the moment is we don't have a Perth side. I think it just fits in with everything, right? There's, there's a rugby league community there, a real strong rugby league community. Time, the time slot is perfect. Yeah, Like it's perfect to, to go live, you know, from, from Perth. Uh, the facilities are outstanding there. I've been, I've been lucky enough to do a couple of games in Perth and I love it every time, you know what I mean? Like I, I've had a good time over there every time. Um, 
And, you know, I know some really good rugby league people over there. So, yeah, I just think if we're going to look at expansion anywhere, Perth has to be it. Like, I've, 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 you know, nothing against another side in Brisbane like we just got, but, you know, I would have went Perth before I went anywhere else. But um, smarter people than me make that decision. Yeah. I think, um, like, for me personally, I think uh, the NRL sort of needs to bring in a draft system to spread out some of this talent. Um, you know, with the young kids coming through because, uh, you know, teams like Perth and the Brisbane team are going to, they might have their locals, the local juniors, but they're going to struggle to get other other juniors from, you know, Sydney or Melbourne or wherever because um, they're not going to be noticed as much. Yeah. And, and it's about creating pathways. So for, you know, for a few years, we had the the Perth teams in our junior rep competitions here at New South Wales Rugby League, you know, so. Yeah, um, the Pirates. Yeah, so if we can continue to try and build those, you know, pathway competitions for, for you know, what we call our emerging states, um, you know, that, that creates more buzz around the game, you know, and, and you're getting, if you get, you've got to build, you've got to build these things from the bottom up, right? You've got to have a base before you can, so if you've got a good, you know, sort of um, local competitions and stuff like that where, you know, you've got good people involved, that's when, you know, you can, you, you can then have the dreams of being part of the, you know, the national competition. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, mate. If you ever, if you ever over these ways in the future, mate, um, don't be shy. You let us yeah, we'll uh, catch, we'll catch up. We'll catch up, catch up for a coffee yeah. or something. Yeah, um, sure. That's all I've got for you today, mate. Um, I really appreciate your time coming on. I know you're a busy man. Um, you know, with the family and the you know refereeing, all that sort of stuff, and your coaching. Um, but yeah, really appreciate you coming on and having a chat with me today about that sort of stuff. No, nah, no problem. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, mate. You have a good day and good luck to Casey and, and yourself for the future, mate. No worries. Catch ya. Thanks. See you, mate. Yeah.